Despite the extreme differences between Islam and Hinduism, it is a Muslim monument that is one of the world's most famous monuments that survives in India, and that, of course, is the Taj Mahal. This is a tomb, and it is a tomb that belongs to the world of Islam. This is figure 336 in our textbook, and it is the Taj Mahal, uh, which was built by Akbar's grandson in the 17th century. Uh, it is an elaborate, stately, and very grand structure. Its surface has the decoration on the surface has the elegance and delicacy of Mughal jewelry making and the same kind of craftsmanship in the construction of the Taj Mahal. It is a tomb. This tomb was constructed under the orders of Shah Jahan, who again is Akbar's grandson, and he ordered the construction of this for his wife, Mumtaz Mahal. This was not because of young romantic love. Uh, Mumtaz Mahal, the woman who is buried at the center of this, had been uh, married uh, to the Shah for almost 20 years, to Shah Johan, excuse me. Um, she married the Shah at 19, and in their years together, uh, she bore him 14 children. She died as a consequence of giving birth to their 14th child. Shah Jahan then had this ordered uh, to be constructed as a memorial to his favorite wife. I do have to stress that he had a harem. Consequently, there were other women uh, with whom he had relations, but it was Mumtaz Mahal that seems to have been close to his heart. Uh, this uh, structure took 17 to 18 years to complete. Uh, it is an amazing building, and it has a dome, in fact, that rises to uh, 213 feet, uh, sweeping upwards towards the heavens. I've seen a number of monuments over my career, and this is the first one. I actually had to stop and stand there and say this is awesome. Uh, it is a truly impressive building. Because of the great scale and elaboration of this, we also really have to examine the possibility that it was made for something more than just a memorial to his wife. And we're going to check that out as a possibility. In design, this construction, which was made out of white marble, doesn't seem to have the heaviness of marble. It seems to float. It seems as if it's a kind of weightless vision uh, located on a podium. So the whole thing is elevated. You can see the base of this located right here. Um, it has shadowy recesses that break up the surface. And you can see a, a great uh, E1 here. And then you can see some smaller niches to the side. And all of that breaks up the solidity of the form. Uh, the dome itself sweeps upward. And we've seen this before. The dome is raised on a drum. Uh, part of what negotiates the space between the body of the building and the floating dome above it, elevated on the drum, are these. And what I would like you to notice is that those are chhatris. In other words, elements of this Muslim building are drawn from Hindu architecture. This is a result of the blending that took place under Akbar. You will find similar chhatris, one, two, three, and four on top of the minarets. So we have four minarets calling us to prayer surrounding this tomb. Now, this is not a mosque. Nevertheless, the minarets have been included. They add to the formality, to the symmetry, and they clearly designate this as an Islamic construction. It does have one source in an earlier construction. It is another, looking at it down here in the lower right, in an earlier Mughal tomb. But that tomb is made out of 
white marble and red sandstone and it doesn't have the elegance uh, that the Taj has. It seems to cling much more to the horizon. But taking that and building on it, the Taj Mahal really has become one of the treasures of world architecture. Um, adding to the breakup of the surface, there is a great deal of pattern that has been inlaid, uh, giving us, uh, again, I think we can say arabesques running across the surface, uh, as well as geometric patterns and designs that seem to team up with the shadowy recesses of those niches and ewans to break up the surface design. And then we have a slide that shows us all of the chhatris that are echoed, uh, helping to unify all of the parts of the overall design of the construction. Due to the surface decoration, uh, the facade, the front walls essentially of the Taj seem to become actually very fragile instead of having the solidity we might expect from marble. The decoration on the surface consists not only of inlaid design that has been carefully craft crafted, I think really coming out of the jewelry uh, tradition, but in addition to that, it has text. And I think you might immediately expect that that text is from the Quran. You can see some of it right here, running all the way around the Iwan. A little bit of a closer look at some of the decoration on the surface, including the inscriptions that run around the uh, archways and also some of the inlaid work uh, here. Uh, that This is what I'm referencing, really. This is a tile mosaic, essentially. Each portion of the petal, for example, of the flower is a separate cut that has been carefully inlaid to create an arabesque or a floral pattern. Uh, the decoration that exists at the bottom right uh, is again an example of blending uh, under Akbar and uh, those close to him. It was possible to open up to the west and what we're looking at here is actually a carving that is influenced by a western herbal, a page that depicts floral forms but very stylized, but also very formal and stately. This is a view inside the Taj, directly under the dome. This uh, monument appears. This is a cenotaph, basically a false uh, coffin, uh, because the burial is actually made underneath the floor. So it is located in the uh, area, the subterranean area of the Taj Mahal. It is a symbolic reference to the burial site of Mumtaz Mahal, directly under the dome itself. Uh, everything here, almost everything here, is entirely symmetrical is centrally planned and as we're looking at the details here this is a gateway eight-sided gateway octagonally uh, created that has been carved out of marble uh, it is a lattice work it is like lace it is elegant it is delicate with inlaid floral patterns in colored stones that have been set into the marble incredible amount of workmanship and I think you can tell why it would have taken 17 to 18 years to finish. This is an overview of what this looks like. Uh, this building is open to the public. You can go and you can make a commemorative visit uh, to Mumtaz Mahal Hall, as well as, oddly enough, to her husband, uh, Shah Jahan. Uh, you might be wondering what is going on here. Uh, in the Taj Mahal, everything is symmetrical except for one thing. That one thing is the false coffin or the cenotaph located right here uh, for Shah Jahan. Before he died, his son usurped the throne, locked up daddy, and kept him under house arrest in a fort nearby. When his father died, the son decided he didn't want to spend as much money as the family had already spent on mommy. So what he did was have his father interred alongside of his wife. 
Uh, this then represents, and it follows Islamic law in India, and that is that uh, Shah Jahan's coffin cover, or his cenotaph, should be larger than Mumtaz Mahal's, which is uh, a tiny bit smaller. So it is the one thing that is asymmetrical within the Taj Mahal. The eight-sided nature of this gate echoes the eight sides of the Taj. And that within Islam is uh, generally considered to be a sacred number. And on at least one occasion, I found a reference to the eight gates of paradise. Okay, that is a hint then that the Taj Mahal is more than simply a tomb. It is a reminder of the basic beliefs within Islam, including the promise of salvation after death. The text from the Quran that is incorporated around the Iwan, in fact, does reference Judgment Day. In addition to that, the Taj Mahal is set into a garden. That garden has water channels. So we know automatically that we are dealing with a reference to paradise, a promise of continuation and salvation, the potential for salvation. The uh, slides over on my right, the top one, uh, does show you that this is a essentially a false ceiling. This is the dome going all the way up. We have a huge empty space, but that would have been way, way too far over our heads. So there's a secondary ceiling that's put in at a lower level so that when we go in, we don't feel like we're inside a silo. Uh, below, this is the basement uh, uh, level uh, where the real tombs are actually located. Uh, this is the garden plan of the Taj Mahal. Um, you can see this is uh, a four-part garden with water in the center. The Taj is at the end of it. It is on axis, and it is, we believe, a reference to paradise. Uh, more shots of the Taj. Uh, one of the things that's amazing about it is, in fact, that it seems to change its modes uh, with the weather and with uh, the light of the day. Uh, one of the things I didn't get to see was how beautiful the Taj is by moonlight. The Taj is flanked by two buildings. The one over here is a mosque. The other building was added simply for symmetry. Uh, the Taj Mahal is a building, uh, perhaps above everything else, that was initially planned uh, for symmetry. And that is one of the features that is inherent in the writing, the style, the writing style of the Quran a kind of symmetrical balance of everything.